الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الكريم وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنة إلى يوم الدين Our praise is due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on his last Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and on all those who follow the path of righteousness until the last day The topic of today's khutbah was concerning holidays and it was in relationship to the people of this country in particular in that this land what we know as Saudi Arabia is one which has a special place in the heart of Muslims Muslims hold this land to be very dear not because of the wealth that Allah has destined to be under the earth here you know, which has enabled the country to, to reach certain standards of development but because of the religious significance of Mecca and Medina that the people many of the people who are here are descendants of the early Muslims of the companions of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and those who supported him and this because of these factors this area has always been uh, loved by Muslims throughout the world you find Muslims would come in the past and coming for Hajj or for Umrah and would just stay here because they would prefer to spend you know, the rest of their lives here many who would come to make Hajj or Umrah would come and stay and it was not because this land as I said had any particular significance in terms of the economic aspects because it was and still is to a large degree uh, a desert area you know where a lot of money has to be spent even to, to turn it into a productive, turn it to make it productive and historically the people of this area had recognized their responsibility the responsibility because of the fact that they were from here, that they lived here to convey Islam to those in other countries when they left here and what you find is historically speaking when you look at uh, Indonesia much of Africa, India, Malaysia, these areas Islam spread there not by soldiers going and fighting, defeating the people and imposing Islam on them but by way of traders people who went there as businessmen selling goods, buying goods but because they came from this area where Islam was a great responsibility on the shoulders of the people these people lived Islam they were examples of Islam and as such even though they didn't know the languages of the people that they went to to trade with etc they made such a marked impression on these people that you found within a few generations huge areas were converted to Islam people accepted Islam in waves and so we have today some of the uh, the majority of, of Muslims are in areas outside of the the center where Arabs are, con are uh, concentrated you know what we call the Middle East this area is only maybe about a hundred million Muslims the Arabs whereas the other 900 million Muslims are elsewhere they are in the far reaches far corners of the world so the Imam spoke of this as a reminder to the people of this land today that in spite of the realities wherein or whereby the people of today who inhabit this land to a large degree cannot be compared with the early generations many are far away from Islam as far as Muslims in the outer reaches of the world and as such they are not any more examples than Muslims we find in our own countries you know whether it's Africa or Philippines or whatever yet when people come here they are thinking as they thought in the past that these people are 
the descendants of the companions of the Prophet Muhammad And of course, for many of us, it is a rude awakening to find that these so-called descendants of the Prophet Muhammad you know, in no way exhibit the qualities that was, were exhibited by the early uh, companions of the Prophet Muhammad and their early descendants. And as a result, what has happened is that the people in these lands, when they have left these lands for holidays, etc., they have not left carrying with them the responsibility. The responsibility of promoting Islam in both word and deed. What we find today is that Muslims are being massacred in a number of places around the world. In Bosnia, what we hear about now, large numbers are being slaughtered. And they're being slaughtered just because they're Muslims. The media tends to put it in a political uh, picture to promote the political aspects of it. But when you look and you see what the Serbs have done to the Muslims there, you realize that it, it goes far beyond politics. Politics as we no, it's international politics. This is something which is a leftover from the Crusades. Because you find the Serbs, after killing Muslims, carving crosses on their bodies, on their faces, and on their bodies, mutilating the bodies in this fashion. And driving out wherever, whichever town they, they capture, they drive out all the Muslims. They clear them out of that area. They have to leave. They become refugees, having to leave those areas. They are trying to remove Islam totally from that area. During the time of communist rule there, the communists tried to crush Islam and they succeeded to a large degree. They reached, the, you know, just before the, the fall of the Russia as we know it, USSR and the other communist states, they, were, and they had forced the inhabitants of Yugoslavia to change their Muslim names. All of them who had Arabic sounding names they were forced to change them over to Slavic names. And there was an ongoing struggle to try to erase Islam. And since the breakup, the Serbs have taken on the banner of continuing that struggle, not under the name of communism, but under the name of nationalism. Now what has happened is that while Muslims are being slaughtered there, we find that the countries that have come to their aid are the Western countries and their aid, the aid is coming through various Christian organizations, Christian missionary organizations who are exploiting the opportunity to draw these people into Christianity. Because when you go to Bosnia, uh, as shocking as it may sound, you will find Muslims there are what of Islam they have is just the name. I mean, drinking, fornication, I mean all these different corruptions that we normally associate with Western society, it, is, it exists amongst these people who consider themselves to be Muslims. Because they have been under pressure, communist pressure for the last 70 years. And it has taken its toll. However, the, in the hearts of the people, there is still a love for Islam. So that when you go and you explain to them, well, Islam, really, this is not allowed in Islam, so on, so on, so on, the people give these things. They want to know Islam. They want to do Islam. But, unfortunately, Muslims are not playing the kind of role that they should be playing there in terms of helping these people. And you find instead many of these European organizations, uh, American missionary organizations are taking the children, the orphans, taking them back to their countries or into other, other parts of Europe and have a concerted plan to Christianize these people. In the past, when Muslims 
heard about the problems which existed in different parts of the world, Muslims of this land, a cry would be given during Hajj and, and other times when people visited here, and aid would be sent to these people, an effort would be made to try to help these people. However, today, we don't find that kind of reaction here or elsewhere. Similarly, in Somalia, after a struggle in the country where the leadership, which was a socialist, communist leaning leadership, was overthrown, but overthrown in a nationalist struggle, you find people being massacred on, on large scale, many Muslims uh, forced out of their homes. You read about the cases of them, you know, taking boats, trying to go to other countries, boats capsizing or whatever. And the UN have declared, has declared this area to be an area of, of uh, tragedy and starvation. There are many people there who are starving to death daily. The Imam quoted that some 5,000 children are dying there daily. Muslim children. And the main sources of aid here again are Christian Red Cross missionary aid. And as the Imam pointed out, what can you expect of a child who is starving to death? There's only skin on top of the bones. And somebody brings food to them, provides them with shelter, aids them, and then offers them Jesus Christ. What can you expect them to do? Muslims are at fault. And these young children or people accept Christianity out of their ignorance because we know the masses of the people in these countries are Muslims by culture. Not Muslims in the sense that they know what Islam is, they're practicing the principles of Islam throughout their lives, they're Muslims by culture. Not just as back in the Philippines or in Sri Lanka or wherever, but you know, the mass of Muslims are by culture. This is what my parents did, this is what my grandparents did, this is what I do. But to say I've understood and I'm clear on what Islam is, most people are not clear. So when somebody brings them Love, because Christianity is always presented from a point of love. Everybody wants love. So when these people come and share and take care of them in the name of love, love which was manifest in Jesus, what are the people to think? What are they to choose? And he also described the situation in Albania, another country which, though the majority of people in the country, some 80%, were Muslims, this country became one of the most communist of communist countries. They broke ties with Russia because they considered Russia to be reformist, you know, breaking away from the traditions. They even broke ties with China when China started to make certain changes. I mean, they were the most communist of the communists. They shut down every masjid in the country, destroyed what they could, turned the others into uh, museums or whatever. I mean, they made some, one of the most vicious attempts to destroy Islam. With the breakup of Russia, that, that society fell apart also. And the people of the country are in a state of dire need. And again, it is the missionary activity that is coming to their aid. So, we should not be surprised if in the coming decades we find a number of these countries which have been traditionally Muslim majorities change. And Muslims of the world will be held to account. But specifically people here because they have been blessed by Allah to be among those who have within the borders of their country Mecca and Medina. And who Allah has also blessed with an extreme amount of wealth. Yet, when we look, as the Imam pointed out, 
and those who leave this country on holidays, we find them spending their holidays in the West or in the East in the centers of corruption. This is the reputation. The reputation uh, of this country. I'm sure in all of our countries we read about stories daily. And pictures will be shown of people from this country committing all kinds of disreputable acts which totally destroy the image of Islam in the minds of the people. And there is very few who would seek to spend their holidays in Muslim lands among the Muslims striving to help those in need. The Imam declared to the people that there are a number of organizations here which are working for the welfare of Muslims in various parts of the world, whether it's in Bosnia, Somalia, or wherever. And these organizations have programs whereby any Muslim who wishes to spend his holidays in the service of Muslims, they can arrange it. They will pay for the tickets and everything. They'll make everything uh, ready for a person who wishes to go and to do that. So he asked Allah to bear witness that he had informed the people here of their duty and of the means to put this duty into effect. And in a general sense, if, because most of us who are here, uh, English speaking, seeking to understand the meaning of the khutbah, we are not people of this land. So the message really as I have explained, it is not as directly related to us. Yet, there is an aspect of it which is related. In that, we all spend holidays. We all are here working. And we think in terms of holidays. And where are we going to spend them? What are we going to do? And it is our duty, Islamically speaking, that when we go on a, on a holiday, and of course the whole issue of holiday, this is something which is part of the effects of Western uh, working principles, you know, like the weekend, etc. All these things are coming from, uh, evolved out of the industrialization of the West, the working systems of the West. I'm not saying that it's bad or anything, but I'm just saying we should understand where it comes from. We now have holidays. Because if you go back to the early Muslims, you know, you don't find any record of people having holidays. You know, you work so many months and you have holidays where you, you go off and just have a good time, sightseeing and things like this. We as Muslims have to reflect that this time, as the Imam has pointed out in the past, the time that we have off, free time, this time still has certain responsibilities linked with it. It's not really free time in that we can just go take off and, you know, see the Eiffel Tower and the pyramids and Taj Mahal or whatever just to, to take off like that and use our wealth in this, in this fashion. Really, Islamically speaking, this is not really allowed. Because of both our time and our wealth, we will be asked about on the Day of Judgment. Allah will ask us about how we spent our money and how we spent our time. So, we do have a responsibility that when we go on quote-unquote holiday, we should be keeping in mind our responsibility to spread the word of Islam, da'wah, we call da'wah, as well as to spend our monies in channels which are beneficial for ourselves, for Muslims. Channels which will increase the reward of our money spent and be a source of blessing for us on the Day of Judgment when we have to stand before God. 
So it is very important that if we go back home for holiday, we don't go back thinking as we thought before Islam, for those of us who were converts, or as the non-Muslims, Kafirs, disbelievers think when they go on holiday. Very important. And when we go back, we go back realizing that we have a responsibility to carry whatever knowledge of Islam that we have gained whilst we're here back to the people, our people, who we return, to whom we return. And that our monies, when we go back, we should not be spending our monies on a bunch of, you know, trivia, buying hi-fi sets and, you know, all this kind of trippings and trappings that we carry back. No. Better we spend this money and buy some Islamic books and take back and give that as a present to our family members than bring back hi-fis and, and uh, walk, uh, walkmen and, you know, we have to be very careful, really, about what we do with our money. So, we should strive our utmost to utilize our time, our holiday time, in the service of Islam, just as we use our working time whilst we're here working. Though we're working for a wage with an intention to use that to benefit our standard of living, at the same time, we have a duty to learn about Islam here where we have an opportunity that we didn't have back, <coughs> back in our home countries as well as to convey Islam to those uh, around us who are either non-Muslims or non-practicing Muslims. Well, this is a duty that we have. It's an ongoing duty. And when we go on holiday, that duty just continues in another form. So the duty of conveying Islam, of practicing and conveying it, is an ongoing lifetime responsibility. It's not something you do for a period of your life. You take a holiday from. No. There is no holiday from the responsibility of Dawah. There is no holiday from the responsibility of spending one's wealth in a fashion which is pleasing to Allah. Just as there is no holiday from Salah. For us, as men, there is no holiday from Salah. We can say, okay, women, when their menses comes, whatever, Allah gives them a break. But for men, there is no holiday. Because ultimately, really, there is no holiday from submission to Allah. That commitment to submission, this is Islam. So when we think of taking a holiday from any aspect of Islam, we're in fact taking a holiday from Islam. We're leaving Islam. Islam is a 24-hour commitment, is a lifetime commitment. We cannot take holidays away from Islam. So, just in closing, the responsibility of us whilst we're here and of the people who are here to exemplify Islam, to live Islam, to convey Islam is something which has been the practice of Muslims of the past and should remain the practices of Muslims in the future. And Islam being not merely words, has to be lived, has to be implemented, has to become manifest in our actions for it to be truly acceptable to Allah. And in that way, we fulfill the responsibilities of submission to God. And we may be able to earn the rewards which He has promised. We have a responsibility to Muslims wherever they are hurt, wherever they are being massacred, etc. And if we are in a position, due to skills or wealth, we should utilize that position to help Muslims. And finally, we should utilize our spare time, holidays, weekends, whatever, in the service of Islam, in the service of Allah, in the service of Muslims. Because it is only in this way that we guarantee for ourselves paradise.
we can guarantee for ourselves paradise by ensuring that we submit ourselves, our time, our wealth, etc. to the service of Allah. Is there any uh, comments or questions anybody would like to raise concerning the topic of today's khutbah? Or any general comments concerning da'wah? Da'wah activities? Questions which have arisen, which you have had some difficulty in explaining? You may also present them. The uh, reference, as-salamu alaykum. Alaykum as-salamu The reference in the clip to the people in this region, Saudi Arabia in particular, being responsible having a, a degree of responsibility over and above the rest of the human. Um, I had a discussion with one of my co-workers in reference to this. And I expressed the opinion that Muslims everywhere are equally responsible once we understand what our responsibilities are as Muslims. And I, I believe that not to refute what the Imam is saying, or even what you're saying, you know, perhaps you can clear it up if I'm wrong, um, that by focusing on Saudi Arabia as being a center, or Mecca and Medina as being some type of a center, or a center for us to focus on, right? I, I believe it would be more correct for us to express a lot of being the center for us to focus on. And thereby, it would establish within the mind of the Muslim that it doesn't matter if you're in Alaska or if you're in Brazil or wherever, you have a responsibility that's equal to the responsibility of the Sahaba. It's equal to the responsibility of the Sahaba. But not because you're born here in Saudi Arabia. That, that doesn't give you any special responsibility, especially if you don't acknowledge it. The responsibility comes to Muslims any place on this earth who pray to Allah and who focus on Allah. And this is what I express to a brother, and, you know, if there's something that I'm saying is wrong about that, please clear it up. Inshallah. Uh, what we could say is that Allah has focused on Mecca and Medina. Allah has designated these areas along with uh, what we know as Palestine where the uh, place of worship built by Prophet Suleiman, you know, uh, was these areas, these three areas have been designated by Allah through the Prophet Muhammad as having particular significance. Worship in Mecca, one prayer in Mecca there is worth a hundred thousand prayers elsewhere. So Allah has designated this place to be uh, of, of a place, a focus, a focal point. Pilgrimage is to Mecca. So this makes it a focal point. Now, those people who are uh, this, this land is, has ended up in their hands. These people do have a responsibility to look after these uh, places which people elsewhere do not have. I mean, we all have a general responsibility in terms of coming and whatever we can to help so and so. But these people who are specifically here, who Allah has blessed with wealth, etc., etc., they have a responsibility over and above. Muslims elsewhere to maintain uh, Mecca and Medina and the Islamic quality of this area. Because Allah, Allah through the Prophet Sallam, commanded Muslims here to remove Christians and Jews from this area. That they would not be allowed in the Arabian Peninsula to set up their places of worship. Whereas elsewhere they are allowed. In Egypt and other Muslim lands, Islam does not prohibit Christians and Jews from setting up their places of worship on land which they own. It doesn't prohibit them. But in Arabia in particular, 
Arabia, in which lies Mecca and Medina, they are prohibited. So, there is a responsibility here, which is greater in this particular regard than the responsibilities of Muslims elsewhere. I agree with you that every Muslim is responsible before Allah based on the knowledge that he or she has gained and they have that responsibility to get the knowledge and responsibility to act in that knowledge and that their responsibility, what they have been given by Allah is not greater than their ability to fulfill it this is what Allah has promised but the reality is that Allah has placed people in different levels of responsibility just as He has placed them in different levels of wealth we're not all of equal wealth though we're all responsible for how we act on our wealth, use our wealth but we're not equally responsible for example if I have a million reals and you have a thousand reals what I am required to give to the, for the aid of Muslims is not what you are required to give there is a greater responsibility on me Allah has given me more money and has given me more of a responsibility this is the reality Allah has put you in an area like the responsibility of the Sahaba in terms of Islam is greater than our responsibility it's not the same it's greater because they saw Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam they saw the miracles they knew that he was a Prophet of Allah on a level that we can never know so their responsibility is greater but Allah did not burden them with a responsibility greater than they could handle He gave us our responsibility and He gave them their responsibility and we all have to answer to Allah but people are on different levels there are different levels of responsibility there are different levels of wealth there are different levels of uh, uh, you know, in, in all aspects of life, we have been placed by Allah on different levels. So I would agree with the Imam and with those who say that the people of this country have a greater responsibility to live up to the image of Islam than peoples elsewhere. We all have a responsibility to live up to the image of Islam. But when a person comes here, which is the center of Islam, considered the center of Islam from the time of the Prophet and will be considered until Yom al -Qiyam. When a person comes here and he finds things which are contrary to Islam, the effect that it has on him is much greater than it does when he runs into a Muslim in America or a Muslim in Philippines, you know, who just he says he's a Muslim. The effect is much greater. And that's why the responsibility of the people here is greater. But they will have to answer to Allah. This is why the Imam was stressing this point to them. That they have this added responsibility. You know, that they are not fulfilling that responsibility. And it means that the punishment is much greater. Because of course that's what happens. Is that when you have a greater responsibility and you don't fulfill that greater responsibility, your punishment is greater also. So rather than being proud about being in this country with all the wealth and, you know, being a descendant of this, you know, like you find, this is one of the things I find sort of funny in um, some of the countries, you know, where... The idea of tracing oneself back to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, is very popular amongst Muslims. So you have certain titles. People will call themselves Sharif or Sayyid. You know, they have these titles that people will take on, you know, which indicates that they are somehow from the family of the Prophet, right? And you find it in other Muslims. But it is something, it's what people are proud of, you know, proud of being. But this person may be drinking alcohol, fornicating and everything else, but he's proud of being a Sayyid. This is delusion. Just as for a person from here to be proud of being, you know, in the, the land of the, the Haramein or whatever, you know. But he is, that person is not living up to that responsibility. It's a delusion. It's ignorance. 
the, 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 the height of ignorance. Because what they don't realize is that the punishment that they're going to receive for having been in that position and not living up to it is so terrible that actually we should not wish to be in their position. Unless such a person is in a position of responsibility and fulfilling it. So this is why Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, I tried it to jealousy. Jealousy, to be jealous of somebody because he's rich or because, you know, he's knowledgeable, to wish that you, you know, this jealousy is prohibited unless the person is rich and is spending money in the path of Allah. So your, your jealousy is not for the material aspect, you know, that thing which you can be proud of. But your jealousy is an is, is expression of a desire to want to do righteousness as this person has done righteousness. This is where it is allowed. But just to be jealous because he has money or he has knowledge, this is prohibited. So similarly, to be jealous because these people have oil wealth, able to build these big palaces and you know, economically speaking they're quite comfortable etc. To be jealous of them is foolish. To be jealous of one who has these things and is using it for the sake of Allah, yes. It's alright. quoted where Allah says to travel in the land and see the end of those before you who disbelieved right the punishment really see Allah's punishment on these people this is different from you know holidaying as people know it when you go with that intention of seeing the sight because you're going to see the sight you're not going to see the sight of the punishment you're going to Disneyland you're going to the Eiffel Tower. These, I mean, for a Muslim to intentionally head out for these places, to spend his money or her money in these places, Islamically speaking, this is despicable. So if you are going to Singapore, it's not that you're going to Singapore to see the sites, and then whilst you're there, you'll also check out the Muslims. No. You go there to work with the Muslim community. 
You want to go? Go there to work with the Muslim community. Not to do it as an afterthought. You know, second, you know, whilst you're there, okay, you'll also check this out. No. You, that your, your primary intention should be to go and to work with the Muslims there. This was the point, you know, that the Imam was uh, raising. But as you said, I agree with you, it is relevant, you know, and as I pointed out to you, it is relevant to all of us. This is the one thing that, like you said, uh, when we look back to history, we found that Islam spread not by force, but by the activities of the Muslim traders who were real Muslims. So you find that nowadays, if we try to make use of uh, the resources that we have for dealing with Muslims everywhere, whether in Singapore or in the Philippines, through the means of trading, I think this is what we are promoting, because through the interaction we find much circulation of all the economic, uh, you know, activities that we have. Like going to Singapore instead of spending your money in the five star hotel not owned by the Muslims, you might as well be living as simple as possible by trying to patronize the Muslim restaurant. Or by buying things from the Muslim shop. Any other comments? I believe that it's advisable to participate in this meeting, so I would like to raise this question. When I listen to a speech about uh, Muslim up there, for example, in the Muslim for example, okay, and my sympathy towards them grows stronger and stronger. But the question remains, what should they do uh, to participate in helping those people, actually our brothers? Uh, should I pray only as the end of that prayer only for them? Or, uh, I believe that I am not a king or I am not a leader of army so that I can take my army and fight those people, okay? Uh, but uh, I know that I have uh, a certain responsibility. What is our responsibility towards you know, our people? Well, as the Imam pointed out, there are organizations here which are involved in raising funds and sending manpower to Bosnia right now. They, huh? they're, they're sending manpower here. There are nurses, doctors, Saudi nurses and doctors and others from other countries who are volunteering to go with groups for, you know, whether it's for one month or for three weeks or whatever, going there to help to deal with uh, the Muslim needs there. You know, besides one who is not able, he doesn't have any skill or anything to offer in that, in that capacity, they're gathering monies, monies which are used to buy uh, food, aid which is needed, as well as, you know, uh, weaponry which is needed for the fight. So, I mean, if we cannot contribute with ourselves, our bodies, then we should at least contribute with our wealth, you know, and that uh, prayer just to sit and to pray, I mean, if we have no wealth or money, our bodies, our skills, well then that's the lowest level, right? <laughs> right? So we, we do that. We should do that anyway. But, uh, you know, only a person who has nothing to offer in these other fields you know, would that be acceptable to Allah from as being all that they did? Uh, as much as possible. <coughs> okay, what about prayer for them? Feeling, I mean, about them, and uh, you know, feel the same sadness, uh, the same suffering that they have. Okay, what about that? Well, it's you know, uh, very significant. Oh, uh, my own. No, of course. Uh, feeling for their situation, being concerned about their situation. I mean, uh, spreading the information about the situation, reading about it as much as we can to, to have that personal concern is something that as a Muslim we are required that whenever Muslims suffer, we should suffer. We should feel that it is somebody that we don't feel sad until it happens to our sister, our father, or our brother. No, these are our sisters, fathers, and brothers in a sense. They're our family. So we should feel inside of ourselves, you know, pain and hurt. We should feel sympathy and concern. And this is what ultimately will motivate us to make the kind of monetary or physical sacrifices which can aid in that situation there. When we have a situation like this, is it permissible for a country to contribute to something else? Now, for instance, one of the GCC countries recently contributed a vast amount of money to save the London Zoo. Where are our brothers are suffering Yeah, this is a gross miscarriage of, of uh, 
And the, our brother was asking whether it would be permissible in a circumstance like this for a country, as was reported in the news, one of the GCC countries, which has access to large amounts of wealth, to contribute, you know, some millions of pounds to save the London Zoo. You know, the zoo that they have in London for animals, right? It had gone bankrupt and they were talking about shutting it down. So one of these countries here donated some millions of pounds to save the London Zoo and the animals in the zoo. Huh? Uh, pardon? Yeah, well, you know, well, uh, we're trying to avoid actually pointing the finger directly at anyone because it's that only an example, one example among many. You know, where money is, which are not really the personal rights of those individuals, see, because what is the result of an ignorance as to who owns money? You know, is this money that you have yours to do with as you please? Or is it money which Allah has entrusted to you as a part of a test of this life to determine whether you have submitted your will to Allah and will use that money in the channels which He has opened for you and avoided using it in those which are prohibited to you. So it is an ignorance of this Islamic responsibility in terms of wealth that has led you know, some people to spend money like this on, on things you know, which are of no benefit to Muslims. You know, as our brother asked you know, whether there were Muslims locked up in the zoo, that the money needed to be spent there. I mean, uh, and this is something which, as Muslims, we have to, we have to recognize our responsibility to, to use that money for the benefit of Muslims. You know, for the benefit of ourselves in halal ways and for the benefit of Muslims. Yes, considering that according to them they were told that in case they will accept Islam here and they are married and their husband is left back in the Philippines in case they have their holiday and their husband are still non-Muslims they are not allowed to I mean, to stay together I mean to, to sit together considering that the husband is still uh, non-Muslim so what Islam can say about this? Well we know that the law, the letter of the law, is that a Muslim woman cannot be married to a non-Muslim man. That's the letter of the law. However, in a circumstance where a woman is married to a non-Muslim, she is non-Muslim, he is non-Muslim, they're Christians, and, they, and she accepts Islam according to the law, then her marriage is sort of put on hold whereby a period of time some scholars hold it to be like three months a period of idda you know whatever a period of time is set for that man to come to Islam if he does not come to Islam then the marriage is annulled it's null, yes, automatically, it's null and void because she cannot be married to him legally speaking according to Islam. So the marriage has no value unless he becomes Muslim. If he becomes Muslim, then the marriage has value, they continue as married, married people. Now, that is going to mean, of course, that if a woman goes back, because there are technic technical factors about it. If a woman, for example, accepts Islam in January, her holiday doesn't come until December. To try to communicate with her husband about Islam, by mail or whatever, it's, it's not that easy. It would be better if she were there to talk to him directly. So, I mean, one would say, though there is that period, perhaps the period should really start when she gets back to Philippines, as opposed to starting at the point when she became Muslim here. Because these are unusual circumstances. Okay? And truly, when she does go back to the Philippines, she is not allowed to have sexual relations with him. Because to do so, in that state where she's a Muslim and he's non-Muslim, this is an act of adultery on her part. Okay? This is the facts of the matter. But now, 
If a person is given a choice between accepting Islam and not accepting Islam, that is accepting Islam but going back and committing according to Islamic law adultery with her husband and not accepting Islam, it's better for her to accept Islam. It is better for her to accept Islam. So the issue of the husband and having sexual relations etc. with the husband should not be raised in the initial stages. It's better in the course of da'wah with people, you know, because the word is circulated, you know, amongst the women that this is what's going to happen. Better to play this down. Not that you say it's not true, so on, so on, so on, so on, but to play it down. To emphasize their understanding of the principles of Islam and accepting those principles. And that hopefully, inshallah, with their own personal growth, they will come to that realization and be able to handle the other aspects. Right? This would be my advice in terms of, uh, of the, the da'wah. Because we have to realize that if a woman accepts Islam and goes back to her husband, her act of going back to her husband does not take her out of Islam. It is a sin. Yes. But it doesn't make her a non-Muslim, a Catholic, disbeliever. So, better for her to be a Muslim than for her not to be a Muslim. So I would say that, you know, we need to keep this factor in mind. And as I said, I'm not saying that if the people ask you point blank that you're now to say, no, this is not the case. No, because then you'll be lying. And later, if the person comes to find out that in fact it is so, then, you know, you've, I mean, you've, you've shown yourself to be deceptive, etc., etc. No. But the idea I would suggest is that this would be played down, emphasis would be made more on understanding the concept of Islam, accepting that, establishing your prayer, you know, step by step. I would hope so. This would not take her out of Islam. It would be a sin on her part for her to marry a non-Muslim. A sin on the part of her parents or guardians who allowed her to do so. But this wouldn't take her out of Islam. Of course, the point is that for a woman to put herself in that position is to put herself in such a precarious position. Why is it Islam prohibits Muslim women from marrying non-Muslim men? But yet Muslim men can marry non-Muslim women. I mean Christians and Jews specifically. Not Buddhists or Hindus or anybody else, but Christians and Jews. Why? Because that relationship, the, the male-female relationship is such that a man who is a Muslim is more likely to cause his uh, family, his wife, etc. to come into Islam. He has control over the family circumstance. The chances of her causing him to leave Islam are very small. Whereas in the case where a woman is under a man who is a non-Muslim, a kafir, then the chances of him affecting her and causing her to leave Islam are great. So for the protection of women, knowing their natures, etc., you know, psychological, biological makeups, etc., Islam has prohibited for their protection. Filipino lady who embraced Islam here and she tried her best to convince the husband to come to Islam, come to the fold of Islam. And when she failed. No, no, uh, what do you mean, Was she here? Was she here? Wait, the, the, the lady is here and the husband is in the Philippines. And for quite a long time, she tried her best to, to, to convince, to persuade the husband to embrace Islam. And ultimately, the fortunate lady husband did not embrace Islam. And what she did, she actually divorced the husband, and now she's married to the Filipino So she had the gut to, to follow what our brother said. Well, you know, uh, let's say that, you know, inshallah, she grew in Islam to the point where her faith now governed her actions. She was no longer following because her desires, her natural desires would be to want to be with her husband. 
But her faith now, or submission of her desires to Allah, led her to give up that person who she had been married to and to follow the commandments of Allah. And, uh, you know, people who have to understand are on different levels. You know, and people grow at different stages. So though this is an example of one sister, we cannot necessarily put it and expect every other woman who accepts Islam to fall right into this mold. No. You know, she may have been more committed, stronger, etc. We have to allow for the differences which exist there. You know, we encourage and we discourage, but we don't prohibit in such a way that we stop people from coming to Islam. So, if a woman is separated, now this is a woman who accepted Islam, she was married to a Christian, and they are separated. She is married to a Muslim. They are separated. Separated but not divorced. If they are not divorced, it is not permissible for her to marry another man. Just the fact that they were living apart for a period of time, if this was based on mutual agreement, then she does not have the right. If she goes and marries another man, she's committing adultery. There must Divorce must take place. Or annulment of the marriage on the basis, for example, say he took off for three years and just left her. He was no longer providing for her and her children or whatever. You know, so she doesn't feel, I mean, he's no longer fulfilling the requirements of husband. Then, the Islamic body in her area can annul that marriage. Say that she is now free from that man. At that point in time, she can marry somebody else. But now, just a woman, for example, they've been separated for three years, you know, they agreed he's got, she went overseas and, he's, and then she decides, well, I'm tired of this man really anyway, I don't like him so much, let me marry somebody else because we've been separated for three years. No, five years, no. It's not grounds, I mean, this, this would be adultery. But the problem, the can is no, not uh, consider divorce. Just not consider divorce. The can is no, we have difficult separation. Yeah, but he said it, he's talking about Muslims. We're talking about two Muslims. A Muslim man, Muslim woman. Now the issue is considering that this Filipino, this Muslim woman, it was formerly a Christian. No, not formerly a Christian. They were both Muslims. Both. both Muslims. They're from Mindanao. They came. You know, she came to work here. She's working as a nurse here for three years, separated from her husband. Is this grounds for her to, to marry somebody else? No, not allowed. Truly, of course, you know, the issues of, of the legal system for, for uh, Christians, because according to Christian law of Philippines, divorce is not recognized, right? Separation after seven years, I think, you know, then people can uh, remarry, right? But in the case of a legal separation, they are then allowed to marry, remarry? Recognize. Mm. Yeah, this is Catholic, uh, Catholic law. Well, I mean, once a person becomes a Muslim, they are no longer governed, you know, in terms of what they have to do by these laws, uh, wherein these laws contradict Islamic laws. So, though the law may not recognize your separation or your divorce. I mean, you still go ahead from an Islamic point of view, and that is sufficient. I mean, this is what Allah is going to hold you responsible for. And now, uh, the, uh, the family, the kids, and the, uh, and, uh, the wife is also Christian. He tries his best to uh, convince the, uh, the family to uh, embrace Islam, but he cannot, uh, he cannot get it, what will be the uh, result for this? Well, in the case of a man, he can remain married to her. You see, Islam does not require him to divorce her. The question of a male who accepts Islam here, right, Christian, male, he accepts Islam here, he goes back to the Philippines, or goes back to his home, wherever, and his family, his wife and children are, are still Christians. He tries to bring them to Islam, but they don't come. I mean, what would he do now? No, he does not, he doesn't, you know, his children are his children, his responsibility. Uh, he, uh, his wife is his wife, remains his wife. But if 
he decides, for example, because the wife may be, you know, um, very negative. You know, maybe so much, you know, so, so, much, uh, so much hatred in her heart concerning him becoming Muslim. That she is, you know, creating havoc in the home. You know, the time comes to prayer, she's making noise, turning up the radio, you know, all the different things, you know, bringing alcohol over and, and she will not submit, at least, to an environment of Islam in the home, then he has the right to divorce her. He has the right to divorce her. He may divorce her to protect his own Islam and marry somebody who's going to help him to grow in Islam. This is perfectly, you know, okay for him to do this. Uh, in terms of his children, uh, he has children, for example, uh, say, who want to live with him who are past the age of puberty, who he is not in a position to insist on them being Muslim. Right? Islam does not tell him he should kick them out of his home. No. He has the means, they're still studying or whatever, he should look after them. However, they would be obliged to obey the principles of Islam in the home. That he's not going to allow them to, you know, to bring in drugs and all. No. As long as they comply to the Islamic principles of his household, they can stay with him. If they don't want to comply, then he has to send them out. Because he has to, in the end, in the environment which he has control over, he has to maintain Islam in that environment. And those who do not wish to comply with those principles, he has to move out of that environment. For protection of his own Islam and the Islam of the rest of the family members. Well, if the children are past the age of puberty, huh? So if they're below the age of puberty, then he should be taking the children to the mosque and, and influencing them to Islam. And it would be better. He really should not allow the mother to continue the Christian religious education of the children. Those that are below puberty. Once they reach puberty, where well, they have a choice of their own now. So then you cannot make that insistence, you know. So that would be the arrangement you'd have to make. Up until that point, you know, you tell her, you've had him for the last nine years, now I want, you know, them for the next five. When they reach fifteen, they can choose for themselves. Let them see this other side. So, if Christian, Yes. Yes, if she's a Buddhist or a Hindu, then if she doesn't accept Islam, he must divorce her. Inasmuch as we are, <coughs> in as much as we are taking this uh, discussion about marriages, I know what I'm about to ask question, this question is a stupid one, but it might happen. Yeah. As we are a uh, Muslim, we are allowed to marry four. Now, my question is, if I marry a woman with a daughter, say, uh, age 18. Then, as the years goes by, I fell in love with a daughter of my wife. Will he ask Muslims to be allowed to marry the daughter of my wife? No. 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 You're not allowed to marry the daughter of your wife. You know? Uh, the fact of, you see, once marriage takes place, then, it's like, it's, it would be the same as marrying the wife of your husband, of your father. You see? Now I know you're not related by blood. You see what I'm saying? Your father, you, your father already has you. Then he marries a woman, right? Who is not related to you in any way. Right? And then your father dies. Or, or is divorced. Are you allowed to marry that woman? No. This is according to Islamic law. That marriage now makes, once you got married, that makes it prohibited for your descendants you know, for you to marry her descendants, for your descendants to marry her, or for you to marry uh, your father's wife, you know, that, that is amongst the prohibited degrees of marriage. Huh? Pardon? Yeah, also the, yeah, the suckling uh, brothers and sisters are prohibited in marriage. No. No. We have to take a gift protection for the orphans and the widows. Mm-hmm. So we are, we are following the Quran. But the Quran also prohibits you from marrying the daughter of your wife. 
there's no prohibition if you have not gone into your wife. Yes, it's different. If you have not had sexual relations with your wife, that's different. You know, if you just married her, before you could consummate the marriage, she died in a car accident or whatever. That's different. But once you've had sexual relations with her, her daughter is prohibited to you, your son is prohibited to her. This is the law. You look after her. You look after her, you know, as a responsibility. But your, your best way is to find her a husband. And those feelings that you have would not be, I mean, Allah won't hold you to account for the feeling that is in your heart. But if you try to express it in word or in action, then it becomes haram, it's sinful. In reference to the, the brother who made a question about the, uh, uh, the, the brother who, who became a Muslim, but he could not change his wife and his children. I've known a case of people who were married 20 to 30 years. And after that 20 year period or that 30 year period, the wife, the brother, he remained a good Muslim, he took care of his family, and that, that was what you meant to write. That, you know, that Islam would affect and she became a Muslim. After 20 years in one place, and 30 years in another. In the case that I know a person, you know, so it, it may not happen overnight, but over a long period of time, eventually, yeah, the chances are very good that you, if you have a good wife, you know. Okay, brother, here, you probably should direct him to where it's stated in the Quran. It is quoting a small part of the Quran, whereas who you you can marry and who you can't marry as explicitly defined in detail, in great detail in the Quran. He probably should be directed to that. You know. Yeah, if we look in the index, in the index of the translation, Yusuf Ali, on the marriage, if they will identify the prohibited degrees. You can go, uh, Surah Nisa, you can go and read and find the exact verses where this particular thing is prohibited. No, this is Is it permissible for a uh, you know, Muslim to give invitations to a non Muslim? Is it permissible for him to call this person brother? You know, be, even, though, even though he may not be his brother, you know, having the same mother and father. And, you know, it's like in terms of, you know, for the, uh, you know, to bring the person to his mom. Because a lot of, you know, mission for our life says that the, the Muslim is a brother. And uh, I, was told, I was told that we cannot refer to a non Muslim as brother using that word. Maybe in Arabic it has a different kind of taste than it does in English. But I was wondering if you uh, heard anything about it or know anything about it. Well, you know, we are the children of Adam. So we're brothers in humanity. Right? If your expression of brother is one of uh, love and favoring of a non-Muslim over a Muslim, this is prohibited. But to use the term, you know, brother as a term of friendship for da'wah purposes, in my view, I do not consider, I, I would not consider this to be prohibited. You know, you have a, a real blood brother. You know, can you call him brother? I mean, that's the question that would have to also be asked if, he's a, if he didn't accept Islam. Can you call him, can you call him brother? Yeah, fine, brother. <laughs> so, this is the point, right? Is that you say, where, where do you draw the line, you know? So, as well, I would suggest that, you know, uh, really, I mean, what is intended when we're talking about the idea of, of friendship, you know, and absolving oneself from certain types of friendship. We're really talking about the kind of friendship where we give precedence, like if we loved our brother, in the sense that a Muslim is in need and we give precedence to our brother over that Muslim, then that is haram. Blood brother who is a non-Muslim, that becomes haram. Because that Muslim is closer to us, according to Islam, than our own blood brother, or our father, or our mother. So we should never give precedence to our non-Muslim relatives over our Muslim brothers and sisters whose 
brotherhood is based on Islam. The question was raised in a discussion by a non-Muslim as to how we can be certain that the Quran was written as revealed. This comes up, of course, you know, in the course of Dawah when we point out to the non-Muslims, the Christians in particular, that their book of revelation has been distorted. There are many distortions in it. Right? And we can bring much evidence for them. So then they turn the question around, well, how do you know? Do you have the original Quran? The one which was written by Abu Bakr? The, you know, in Abu Bakr's time? Do we have it? No. We don't have it. But the point is that, how do we know when something is not original? Or not, right? Anything which comes down to us, any document which comes down to us. How do we? You know, there are, there are ways that scholars have used to determine the authenticity or correctness of a given document. One of the ways is that this document has been reproduced, reproduced, right? And the copies are found in various parts of the world. They bring the copies together. If they find discrepancies then doubt now arises concerning the original. And through comparison with the discrepancies, you're able to determine which one ultimately may have been the original. Right? And this is why we know that the text of the Bible is in dispute. Because there's so many copies that were made with so many variations that it becomes impossible now to identify what in fact was actually the original document. And, now, and then the issue of the original being written in another language, in Aramaic, for example, the Gospel of Jesus in Aramaic, and Jesus spoke Aramaic. And what is available now is in Greek. This makes it even a bigger problem. Okay? Now when we look on the side of Islam, in the case of the Quran, what we have is a document in the language of the Prophet. Right? The copies which have been found, printed from the first generation, pieces of which can be found in various museums in Russia, Tashkent, and in, in, in uh, Egypt, and in Turkey, and in, in the museum in, uh, in London, in, in uh, the Library of Congress in, in, in Washington, these portions have been compared. And they have not found any discrepancies which convince Western scholarship who are looking specifically for discrepancies convince them that the document that they have the Qurans that were available today are correct replicas of that early written Quran but that the text itself has been memorized by hundreds of thousands of Muslims down through the centuries this is the only book of its kind that has been memorized in this way, from cover to cover. With, in such a way that if you try to introduce any kind of variation, those who have memorized will be able to spot it right away. So it has been protected and, and been preserved, not only in the written form, but in the memorized form. So you have a dual form of protection of the text, which no other text can claim. This is the only text in the world, the only religious text in the world, that has been protected both in the written form and in the memories of the people. Brother, just mentioning that sometimes in prayer, I mean, I'm sure we've all experienced it, where the Imam, the person leading the prayer, may miss a word or miss a verse, and the people behind will correct him immediately. Okay, inshallah, if there are no more... Uh... We, have a, we have a new brother today. And actually, after, after we finish, or actually, if there are new... A new brother meaning yeah. what? Somebody wants to accept it, right? Just because they accepted it two days ago. They accepted it two days ago. Okay, you want to introduce him to people, inshallah? Thank you.
Yeah, your name, brother? Dante. Huh? Dante. Dante? Uh, you accepted Islam two days ago? Yes. Okay. Congratulations, brother, and uh, we pray that Allah will uh, continue to guide you and um, you continue to come with us and to be amongst Muslims because, of course, it's very, very important when one accepts Islam that one spends time amongst the Muslims, amongst those people who will remind him of Allah and help him to grow. Because if you keep around you uh, non-Muslim friends, not to say that now you've become Muslim, you just cancel all your, your non-Muslim friends, you say you don't want to have anything to do with them anymore. No. You still continue your relationship with them, but it's now a relationship of, of uh, because of your duty to convey the message of Islam to them. But it, because if you spend all your time around them, and you know that they're, what they're about, what, they, what they're seeking, what they're uh, looking for in this life, is not what you're looking for. It means that it will weaken you, what they talk about, you know, what they uh, talk about when you're around them, what you discuss, etc. These are things will be, which will be causing you to forget God. So you don't want to spend all your time amongst them. You spend time amongst them to convey the word of God to them. But you should try to spend as much time as you can amongst Muslims so that you can gain more of the word of God and to grow spiritually. Inshallah. Okay, we close. Uh, Subhanakallahum wa bihamdika. Ashadu wa la ilaha ilaha ant. Astaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. We ask Allah to help us to use our spare time, our holiday time, in the service of Allah and in the service of Islam to realize our responsibility in using our wealth responsibly in a way which is pleasing to Allah and also to use our time in a similar fashion. Amen.